Good morning again. One of my teachers, who is a retired hepatologist uh, at Northwestern University in Chicago, likes to instill me with a lot of little sayings that I find incredibly helpful. And the, my favorite one that Al Baker um, says to me once in a while is he says, John, it is easier to stay out of trouble than to get out of trouble. And he says it in his South Carolina Southern accent. And you know, there's a lot to that message. It is a lot easier to be careful about everything you do to what extent you can so that the likelihood that the outcome will be positive without having to intervene for a negative outcome later on is what ultimately results. Unfortunately, that's not always the way that life works. And so even when the process is perfect and you did everything correctly as a physician or a surgeon, the outcome may not necessarily be perfect. This is a situation that a transplant surgeon finds himself or herself in, and that's when a friend in need is a friend indeed, and a friend indeed is a friend twice, because you are the friend as the interventional medical endoscopist helping both your transplant surgeon whose patient has sustained a surgical complication, as well as that surgeon's patient, who is now your patient, who you will now help to overcome that surgical complication. And if you think about it, you've not only gained two friends, but you've gained three, because the patient's family will be eternally grateful that you've kept that patient from going back to the operating room or worse. Herein lies the durability of ERCP. We're talking about a nearly half century old technology and technique that in spite of all the changes that have come about has remained a robust therapeutic instrument. And there are a number of reasons for this that include the changes in incidence and prevalence of diseases. There are new surgical uh, procedures that beget new surgical anatomy, and those new surgical anatomies beget new surgical complications heretofore unseen. Also, there are changing patient expectations that we all have to deal with as physicians, uh, no matter what type of physician or surgeon we are. There are. They want less invasive interventions. They don't want to go to the operating room unless necessary, and that's understandable. There's a desire to avoid incisions, general anesthesia, and hospitalization. Why is it that ERCP has remained such a robust therapeutic instrument? In spite of advances in non-invasive cross-sectional imaging like CT and MRI, as well as EUS, uh, it's actually an incredibly minimally invasive interventional world out there, and that's where ERCP has maintained its robustness. As you can see in this uh, paper from Mazen Jamal several years ago, ERCP has uh, maintained its ground and even more when it comes to a specific type of ERCP and that's therapeutic ERCP. While we've been supplanted to a great degree in the biliary tree diagnostically by MRCP and in the pancreas by EUS, ERCP remains robust when used as a therapeutic instrument. Of course, age has something to do with this. The population continues to grow. Patients are getting older, which means every one of us is living longer. And as we live longer, we incur more disease processes along the way. As we talked about earlier this morning, obesity consider, uh, continues to be an increasing problem. And as you know, obesity can result in biliary disease in a number of different ways. Uh, not, not only that obesity increases the risk of steatotic liver disease and that primary liver disease is an independent risk factor for stone disease, but also that that may uh, beget cirrhosis, which may beget a liver transplant, which then begets uh, liver transplant complications. Obviously, uh, excess weight is an, an independent risk factor for stone formation and rapid weight loss after bariatric surgery or weight loss from any reason uh, can also increase uh, bile duct stone incidence resulting in the need for ERCP. And as more people have liver disease and there's a greater need for liver transplantation, two negative things are going on. One is that the organ donor pool is decreasing at the same time that the quality of organs because of donor age, donor weight, 
donor disease, etc., that organ quality is declining. So what happens? You have to go for those livers that are less healthy uh, graft organs. They include livers from older patients, patients who have fatty liver, patients who have died a cardiac death and the liver has a greater risk of sustaining ischemic damage before implantation into the recipient, or you may need to reach for a living donor right lobe or in the sitting of a child, a left lobe. So all of these livers uh, in the expanded donor pool, so to speak, have an issue with organ quality or have a more difficult uh, technical challenge for the surgeon. Uh, and particularly, uh, deceased donor uh, uh, liver transplantation has a much, much higher complication rate, especially a biliary complication rate with a, an excess, actually an excess of 40% of ischemic cholangiopathy resulting. And most of these patients require retransplantation, but they will not achieve a MELD score to, to get a new liver uh, for a long time. And you as the biliary endoscopist are left dealing uh, with that patient's biliary complications, helping them to limp along if and until they can get a second liver transplant. So indeed, uh, as Sir Roy Kahn, the uh, English uh, father of liver transplantation once said, biliary complications are the Achilles heel of liver transplantation and it's your job as a gastrointestinal endoscopist to do something about that not always uh, an easy thing to deal with. In fact, my colleague and fellowship Mike Sossenheimer wrote this paper nearly 20 years ago looking at a survey of 30 transplant centers and documented that an up to one-third uh, incidence of biliary complications after orthotopic liver transplantation with cadaveric organs, and that actually increases two to four-fold with living donor liver transplants. The most common biliary complications after liver transplantations are bile leaks and bile strictures. Ischemic cholangiopathy is a severe one. Ampullary stenosis is also seen. And we'll talk about these in some detail momentarily. Bile leaks are easy to deal with. Their incidence has been in decline because fewer and fewer transplant centers perform their biliary uh, or bile duct ana uh, anastomosis over a T-tube. It used to be when the surgeon removed the T-tube frequently, the tract that the T-tube ran through would leak. The patients would stain, uh, sustain an acute and severe bile peritonitis with severe pain, and you would be called in for an urgent ERCP and a stent placement. You would choose a short, large diameter stent because you remember Poiseuille's law from high school physics, uh, and uh, you would go in and remove that stent with an EGD uh, two to 12 weeks later, uh, long after that leak had spontaneously sealed. Your uh, radiologist would also place a percutaneous drain to drain that painful bile collection. Strictures, on the other hand, occur in about 15% of cadaveric liver transplants, but up to 50% of living donor liver transplant for a number of technical reasons. As you know, the usual presentation is that these patients get liver enzymes checked weekly. The transplant hepatologist will notice uh, a gradual or acute rise cholestatic pattern uh, in the liver enzymes, which will then prompt typically non-invasive cross-sectional imaging, uh, which may or may not demonstrate biliary ductal dilatation, leading to either a biopsy or a call to you to uh, investigate their bile duct and treat uh, any stricture or filling defect that's uh, found at that time. Biliary strictures are often described in the anatomy as being anastomotic or non-anastomotic. Non-anastomotic I find to be a very vague term which I would discourage you from using and instead encourage you to describe it for what it truly is, which is ischemic cholangiopathy. The technique is as easy as dealing with any other stricture. In fact, most of these uh, in cadaveric uh, transplants are much easier than other types of strictures to treat and frankly sustain a more durable response. Get a guide wire across, use your uh, fluoroscopic guidance to dilate with a hydrostatic dilation balloon, and then place one or more stents 
that will increase the durability of that dilation that you just performed. I think you can see the waist here on this cholangiogram, which is where the stricture is. The balloon is inflated with half strength contrast until the waist disappears, uh, and then a stent or additional stents are placed, which will generally double the durability of the stricture that you just dilated. If the stricture is particularly tight, you may need to use a self-tapping screw dilator or other instrument that will then allow you to get your balloon up and do your dilation, followed by the placement of a stent. There have been a number of meta-analyses as well as small series looking at this phenomenon of whether you should stent or not after dilation. Um, Schwartz is, uh, is the one that's oft quoted and showed a doubling of the durability uh, of the work that you do to dilate a focal biliary anastomotic stricture after transplantation if you stent it with at least one stent afterwards. Other studies have demonstrated essentially the same results anywhere from 50 to 100 percent uh, therapeutic success with an acceptable complication rate that is generally comparable to ERCP performed therapeutic for other reasons other than this ELMI study, which had an unusually high pancreatitis rate not seen in other studies. Ischemic cholangiopathy can be less uh, satisfying to treat. You will not cure these patients. Most all of these patients will end up requiring a liver transplant later on, but they frequently won't get that transplant for several years. You're left dealing with this uh, with recurrent uh, stricture dilations, stent placements, and clearance of ischemic casts. Preservation injury results in some of these when there's a cold ischemia time of 10 to 15 hours. Hepatic artery thrombosis or hepatic artery stenosis, typically at the site of the hepatic artery anastomosis, uh, will cause ischemia to the bile duct, which uh, receives its circulation only from the hepatic artery and not from the portal vein, as the rest of the liver does. You will know that this is ischemic cholangiopathy because only the donor side of the bile duct will demonstrate these changes and the recipient side will remain smooth and with a normal contour. As you can see, this is a typical example of ischemic cholangiopathy, beading and stricturing changes, filling defects. Only on the donor side of the biliary tree, the recipient side is smooth and completely normal. Ischemic casts form because bile duct uh, uh, cholangiocytes die. That attracts bacteria to set up shop, which deconjugate the bile, and that necrotic biliary epithelium along with bacteria and deconjugated bile forms a rubbery cast that you actually have to agitate because it's intimately associated with the wall of the bile duct, and you actually have to peel it off frequently with a basket and a balloon. I think you can see these filling defects as casts throughout this donor bile duct. Again, the recipient bile duct is normal. Sometimes it's much more subtle, particularly early on, it looks like intrahepatic duct only, mild primary sclerosing cholangitis. You need to perform a balloon occlusion cholangiogram to fill the intrahepatic ducts all the way out to the periphery so that you don't miss early ischemic cholangiopathy, which you may be able to limit if you recognize this, call your transplant surgeon, and the surgeon sends the patient to interventional radiology to have that hepatic artery dilated and or stented, or takes the patient back to the operating room. Here you see central involvement of the hyalur intrahepatic ducts, beading and stricturing changes, filling defects consistent with ischemic cholangiopathy. In this duct, I think you can see lots of casts here where there's no contrast. Again, the recipient duct is completely normal, and you'll have to work frequently for an hour or two to remove as much of this material as you can so that you can get rid of the jaundice, get rid of the cholangitis, get rid of the severe pruritus that these patients have to live with if and until they can get another transplant. Here I'm peeling the cast off with a basket. This is very laborious. You need to push the basket into contorted positions to get around this. It's very much like dealing with a large stone that's very difficult to capture in all four wires of your basket. But if you work hard, you'll be rewarded with a mother load uh, of debris that will come out in the form of casts and stone-like sludge material. You may want to permit that material to continue to pass between procedures by placing multiple stents, which will act like a wick and allow that material to pass between your recurrent ERCPs. Living donor liver transplant has gained in popularity worldwide because of the lack of uh, enough uh, donor uh, cadaveric liver supply. 
The uh, shortage remains critical. These are usually for adults. A right lobe is donated from the healthy donor uh, into the uh, ill uh, recipient. There are a number of reasons why the biliary complication rate is so much higher than it is with orthotopic cadaveric donor liver transplantation. Remember that there is a cut surface of the liver where multiple small bile leaks can occur. There are multiple anastomoses, more than one sometimes, and the bile ducts that have to be anastomosed are very small. So all it requires is a very tiny bit of edema or stricturing at that, at that small luminal anastomosis and the complete duct will be uh, obstructed. Same thing with the arteries. The arteries are many, they are small, multiple anastomoses lead to anastom uh, multiple anastomotic complications at a higher rate that can induce more ischemic cholangiopathy. There's increased tension on these small anastomoses uh, and so forth. And as you can see from many of these surgical journals uh, pictures, uh, the bile duct is not always perfect for the surgeon. They have to do an MRI before the uh, donor is chosen. And then once in the OR, they may deal with surprises, having to come up with creative ways to use the cystic duct remnant or further dissect out the hilum in order to come up with an adequate anastomotic anatomy as drawn in some of these pictures that my very artistically talented GI fellow uh, drew for me several years ago. Here's a right lobe living donor graft. You can see no left bile ducts here, and you can see a focal biliary anastomotic stricture. We were just talking about the rate of biliary complications being upwards of 40 to 50 percent in these living donor patients. Some of them have a Roux and Y anastomosis. Some have a duct to duct anastomosis. The Roux and Y's tend to have more leaks. The uh, colodococolodocostomies tend to have more strictures. Since these are the ones you tend to treat, you'll tend to deal with strictures more in these living donor patients. As you can see, there's our stricture I just showed you. Get a guide wire across it. Since there's only one anastomosis in this patient, this is just like treating a whole liver transplant patient. You'll frequently need to repeat it. You can only use a small balloon in a small duct diameter, and so you may have to bring the patient back for more procedures. Sometimes the ducts have to be brought together because they don't come together at the uh, resection margin. So the surgeon will do a surgical ductoplasty and then take that ductoplasty anastomosis and anastomose it to the recipient duct. This can be fraught with more complex strictures that go up into the donor ducts themselves. You may not uh, be in a situation where just dealing with one stricture is enough. Here you've dealt with this stricture, but you don't want the uh, stent in that side to block off the other side. So you may need to stent the side that's not strictured just so that uh, that side of the bile duct is not jailed by the stent that you needed to place in the other side. So here again, the right anterior and right posterior donor ducts are opacified. We get guide wire access to actually all three so that we don't block the side that isn't strictured. You may want to keep guide wire access with multiple wires because you may not be lucky enough to get back in there again and deploy three stents uh, so that all three main systems are adequately drained. Here, I think if you look closely, there is a leak at the cut surface of the right uh, lobe donor graft here. But if I place a stent in here, I'll block off the right posterior duct so I know going in that I will need to stent both sides, which is exactly what I did in this case. Some of these cases, as you can see, can be very complex. And of course, ischemic cholangiopathy, we were saying, can occur in these patients as well. A balloon dilation, clearance of cast, and then placement of stents. There aren't good studies to tell you what to do differently about these patients, so you need to be more creative, uh, and it will require uh, a, a lot of small stents rather than large stents, which will not only be too large for the lumen of the duct, uh, but also uh, may not be flexible enough to accommodate the tight bends and turns that are required in doing this kind of work, which is more akin to pancreatic ERCP work than it is to common bile duct biliary work. There uh, is a nationwide consortium in the United States called the A2ALL group uh, carefully analyzing data from pools of living donor liver transplants that in the future will give us uh, guidelines as endoscopists for how best to manage these patients. 
One of my favorite quotes is that you can't do today's job with yesterday's methods and be in business tomorrow. And I think that's very true for you as an interventional endoscopist. Don't forget the rue and why hepaticojejunostomy liver transplant patients. They get complications too, but unfortunately your side viewing duodenoscope cannot get to that anastomosis. For that, you will frequently need a balloon enteroscope, which is something I do at least once a week for ERCP in these patients. This is a very laborious procedure that's a labor of love, love that can take uh, two to four hours to accomplish. Uh, you can't shorten the bowel too much with these patients using the balloon enteroscope because there are places where uh, the small bowel goes through and is sewn to a mesenteric window. There's also a hepatico, uh, rather a jejunojejunostomy anastomosis. There's also an area in the proximal end of the afferent rue limb where the jejunum is actually sewn to the, uh, the uh, plate of the liver. And as a result, there's only so much shortening you can do. And if you're not careful, you'll cause uh, a serosal tear, a perforation, uh, or a mesenteric tear. I think you can see the air cholangiogram here, which is a good clue to tell you that you're headed in the right direction. Once you get there, you can use some long instruments that you can buy from the same manufacturers that provide your regular length instruments to perform your cholangiogram. You will frequently see an area where there's uh, two ducts coming together. It almost looks like you're doing a bronchoscopy. You'll recognize the biliary epithelium. In these situations, there's no papilla, so you can see right into the bile duct, which actually is an advantage. This will be on the side wall of the jejunum because this is uh, an end-to-side hepaticojejunostomy type of construction. Be very careful to go all the way to the end of the jejunal limb. You will find the biliary anastomosis 5 to 10 centimeters downstream as you pull your scope back, much uh, in the way that you look behind haustral folds when you're doing a colonoscopy on scope withdrawal. Here is a very stenotic uh, biliary anastomotic stricture. I couldn't get a balloon catheter through it. I used a five French tapered catheter to get in and undertake my cholangiogram, followed by the placement of an 018 guide wire. I've passed over that uh, a passage dilator. As you can see, the ostium is bigger now. I chose not to do a balloon dilation yet in this setting because it was so small and I didn't want to risk inducing a perforation because this patient was very sick. Remember that you can put seven French stents uh, through a balloon enteroscope. It is big enough for a seven French stent. It will require some physical work on your part, but it will go through there. You do not want to risk these stents migrating uh, internally. You'll have a very difficult time removing them, so you may want to consider using a single or double pigtail stent to reduce that risk of in-migration. Here I think you can see another stricture uh, that was treated with a balloon dilation in the placement of two stents. I think you can see that this uh, anastomosis is almost completely closed off. I've got a hydrophilic wire now replaced by a standard monofilament wire. The cholangiogram is undertaken. The bile ducts themselves actually look very smooth and healthy without any ischemic stigmata. So this is clearly nothing but an anastomotic stricture. A balloon dilation is undertaken with a long uh, hydrostatic balloon. This is a six millimeter balloon. The process is the same otherwise as with an ERCP. A nice response you can see up the bile duct and then the placement of multiple single pigtail stents uh, to increase the durability of the dilation that was just undertaken. So there is some new technology or newer iteration of technology on the scene. Uh, there uh, is still wanting uh, actual video colodocoscopy like you see here. Um, the advantage of this for post-liver transplant patients, I think, is as yet unclear. I was hoping that these scopes would provide an ability to target inserting wires into specific intrahepatic duct radicals. Unfortunately, there isn't typically enough diameter room in the lumen of the bile duct to allow much movement of the tip of these colodocoscopes, enough to uh, have them really give you much in the way of uh, actually targeting your guide wire unless the duct is much bigger. 
There are other groups looking at being able to bury stents without leaving the distal end of the stent out into the lumen of the duodenum where uh, food from the duodenum can reflux up into the stent and reduce its lifespan. There was a Japanese group that about uh, a decade ago worked on developing some uh, changing or modifying some plastic stents so that you can deploy them completely inside the bile duct, only having the monofilament uh, uh, tag hanging out of the papillary orifice. Uh, these stents lasted up to a year um, before needing to be exchanged. So in summary, I think change is opportunity in biliary endoscopy for liver transplant complications. As you can see, new operations like living donor liver transplant create new anatomy and new surgical biliary complications uh, that can rep uh, represent actually some of the most satisfying, uh, intense, and uh, robust uh, results for you as an interventional endoscopist. Ischemic cholangiopathy, complex biliary anatomy in the form of Roux and Y and living donor liver transplant will represent really the major growing therapeutic challenges, I think, for the transplant biliary endoscopy for the foreseeable future, as well as an extremely fertile area for you to work hand in hand with both your surgeon, your hepatologist, and your interventional radiologist. Thank you very much.